I found out that I have ALS in August of 2015. That was a life-changing moment. Although I knew I had been sick since 2013. In May of 2014, I was hospitalized in the ICU for life-threatening breathing problems. I was even um, in the, uh, I was in a coma for a while, but they still didn't diagnose ALS at that time. But it's not unusual for people that get ALS to have to wait years for a diagnosis. There is no blood test for ALS. Instead, you find out for sure you have it by measuring changes in, in nerve conduction properties. After my hospitalization, which lasted 10 days, I pretty much put the prospect of ALS out of my mind. <laughs> Nobody ever mentioned ALS, but I knew it. I might have ALS. In the movie, the theory of everything about Stephen Hawking there's a scene where he receives his diagnosis that he has ALS. <laughs> Reality fades, his eyes go out of focus, and he stops listening to the doctor. <laughs> that is essentially what happened to me. <sighs> the most famous American that ever had ALS was Lou Gehrig. He was the captain of the New York Yankees when he was when he got the disease. And he gave a famous speech at Yankee Stadium when he had to retire. After that, ALS became known as Lou Gehrig's disease in the US anyway. I prefer to think of it as Stephen Hawking's disease. Partially that's because I have a lot more in common with Stephen Hawking. But also because Stephen Hawking lived 55 years and Lou Gehrig died after two years. I think the crucial difference between Hawking and Lou Gehrig is that Stephen Hawking could still do theoretical physics after he got the disease. Whereas Lou Gehrig couldn't do that anymore. Another thing is that Lou Gehrig didn't have very good options on the medical equipment that was available at the time. He had to make a very stark choice between being imprisoned in a, an iron lung or suffocating. If Lou Gehrig was diagnosed today, he would have other choices. Ventilators have solved that problem. I myself um, am on a ventilator 24 hours a day. This device I'm breathing with now is called the Sip and Puff. And I usually favor this when I'm talking to people. The reason is that I get to choose when I inhale, so my speaking is more natural. But there are two other devices I use to breathe with during the day. And this short video will show you about those other means. This is my nasal pillow. It is hooked up to a ventilator and it allows me to speak pretty well. Especially with the modifications I've made to the breathing cycle.
Even so, I have to stop speaking whenever it's time to inhale. This is the full face mask. And as you can hear, I'm barely audible. All three of the methods I use to breathe with are called positive pressure ventilators. That means that air is blown into my lungs to help me breathe. But that's not the way we normally breathe. In normal breath, your diaphragm muscle pulls your lungs down to cause an inhalation. In my case, my diaphragm muscle is completely paralyzed. There are prior art methods that are called negative pressure ventilators that suck air into your lungs. This slide shows two of those prior art methods, the iron lung and a cuirass ventilator. You can survive in an iron lung, but you don't really have a life. The cuirass ventilator shown on the right is an improvement. A rigid shell surrounds the patient's chest, and the pressure is varied in that shell. Similar to the way the pressure is varied in an iron lung, except that it's smaller, and it can at least be moved around easier. But it's not really portable. In my invention, the conformal vest ventilator is fully portable and will be the next stage in the evolution of negative pressure ventilation. After my ALS diagnosis, it took me a while to get back onto a positive path. But I did manage to return to my roots as an inventor, a scientist, and an entrepreneur. Starting in early 2019, I focused my inventive attention on medical devices that could help me. Because I live on 24-7 ventilation, I naturally invented two kinds of ventilator shown in the next slide. The left thing is a uh, patent illustration on the conformal vest ventilator. Uh, and that's what I've spent most of my time on. On the other panel is the shared manifold ventilator. I invented the shared manifold ventilator because of COVID-19. In March, it became obvious that there were going to be a lot of people die for lack of ventilators. So I developed this shared manifold ventilator. It's designed to ventilate an entire hospital ward at much lower cost per patient than any other ventilator design, while at the same time allowing each individual patient to have their oxygen levels and their breathing cycles be independent, which is different than other shared manifold ventilators you may have heard of. Anyway, I've turned that over now to a design team at UNC Charlotte, and I'm focused on the conformal vest ventilator. This animation shows how the vest ventilator works. I invented the conformal vest ventilator with my brother Rob, who is a retired ER doctor. The vest ventilator works by expanding around your thoracic cavity and pulling your chest out. In order for it to work, it must maintain contact between the vest and your skin, and that's done with a mild vacuum.
The mechanism for the vest is that there are multiple tubes embedded within the structure of the vest. And these tubes are specially designed so that they lengthen whenever they're inflated. The enabling technology is um, that the tubes are highly anisotropic. They have a much higher modulus in the circumferential direction compared to the axial direction. This is achieved by embedding oriented fibers in the tube wall. This is very similar to the way a pneumatic tire works. And my first job after college was as a tire engineer. It's as a result of that background that I could see the possibility of making the conformal vest ventilator work. <laughs> the conformal vest ventilator will allow me to walk into a room without the first thing you notice being that I'm breathing with the help of either a tube like this one or the nasal pillow. It also has medical benefits because tubes in your mouth, nose, or trachea are sources of infection that can kill you. The conformal vest ventilator is also energy efficient, which means it will be completely portable. Many people that get ALS have to have tracheostomies. That's a surgical procedure where a tube is inserted into your trachea. After a tracheostomy, you can't talk anymore. I'm very lucky among ALS patients because I can still talk and eat normally. I use my voice to create documents, including my patent applications, and my voice is critical to me. Avoiding a tracheostomy was a major motivator for me to invent the conformal vest ventilator. Although I invented it for myself and other people with neurological conditions, it turns out that the conformal vest ventilator is very applicable to other medical problems, <laughs> including spinal cord injuries, COPD, sleep apnea, and asthma. The status of my project now is that I have demonstrated the anisotropic tubes, which are the basis for the invention. <laughs> I have filed an international patent application, and I've done a preliminary submission to FDA. I expect to have a bench scale prototype done by Christmas. I am way more experienced as an inventor than as an entrepreneur, but I am pursuing this idea as an entrepreneur. One of the best ways to change the world is to build a successful company. Just ask Elon Musk. My whole life, I've been primarily motivated by inventing things to make the world a better place. <laughs> the conformal vest ventilator is just the most recent example. 
if you do feel there's something you want to do to improve the world, don't let impediments and obstacles stop you from trying. But even if you fail, you will have tried. And when it's your turn to die, you won't have regrets about not having tried. Bless you and thank you for listening. <laughs>